following program is sponsored. The opinions and statements made by the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the views of WBOB or its parent company, the Chesapeake Portsmouth Broadcasting Corporation. WBOB AM 600 The Answer is proud to present Tula's Tips for Caregivers. Help is on the air with Tula Wooten, your source to go for resources and information to help you in this rewarding but sometimes challenging role. Tula's Tips for Caregivers is brought to you by AgeWell Institute at Baptist Health, by Elmcroft Assisted Living and Memory Care, by the AARP, and by Bartram Lakes Brooks Assisted Living. To participate in today's show, call 904-222-TALK. That's 904-222-8255. Now here's Tula. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to my show, Tula's Tips for Caregivers. As you heard the announcer say, my name is Tula Wooten, and I've been doing this radio show now for over six years, every Saturday morning. This is a show dedicated to those of you in our community and elsewhere who are taking care of a loved one. One of my favorite phrases that somebody asked me about just this week and asked me to quote actually comes from Rosalind Carter, who um, started uh, as a caregiver when she was 12 years old, taking care of her grandmother. And her famous quote is, there are only four types of people in this world. Those who are caregivers, those who've been caregivers, those who are going to be caregivers, and those who need care. And that is just the simple truth. Caregiving is going to touch all of us in our lives at one time or another. We all have people we love. We all watch loved ones age. Sometimes we are caring for someone who is younger than us and has special needs, and we end up caring for them. But regardless of age, regardless of timing, all of us will be taking care of a loved one at some point in time or another. And, you know, caregiving is one of those roles that can be very sweet and very rewarding as you have such special times with your loved one but it can also be challenging. So that's why I do this show on Saturdays, is to reach out to caregivers to hopefully offer you some help and some encouragement, maybe a little inspiration to keep on keeping on, and access to community resources that can help you. My background is medical social work. I worked in that field for many years, um, primarily with frail elders and their family caregivers. So I'm pretty well versed on what's out there to help you. So if you have a need, I really encourage you to call in today. Um, We're going to be talking about a special topic today, but if you have um, the courage to call in and be live on the air and ask a question, make a comment of myself or my guest, I'll be happy to send you a Starbucks gift card. So call in. The announcer gave the number. It's 904-222-TALK. Now, I'd like to go ahead and introduce my guest. He's somebody who has become a friend in what I call caregiving world. We both our kindred spirits, and that we both have a lot of the same goals when it comes to taking care of those who are caregivers. And he's been a caregiver himself. So before I say too much more about you, Chris, let me welcome Chris McKellen to the show. Welcome, Chris. Well, greetings, Tula. It's uh, great to be back uh, with you and all your listeners. Well, I'm thankful to have you back. Thank you for coming on my show today. Um, As I just alluded to, we've known each other a couple of years now, Chris, I think we got connected by a former um, by a colleague who also does a caregiving radio show. And Chris, you have your own radio show um, that you've been doing for some time. You are the founder of what is the name of your company again? I do apologize. Uh, the, the Whole oh. Care Network. The Whole Care Network, and the name of your radio show. My name of my show is Healing Ties from the Bow Tie Guy. And, and uh, we're on. We're an internet show that can be found on Spreaker and uh, my website, thebowtieguy.com. And I'm looking at your website right now, and you're also known as, uh, on thepurplejacket.com. How did that name come about? Well, the Purple Jacket, that's, that's the original uh, blog that I started uh, a few years ago when my partner Richard was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And uh, I do actually own a purple jacket, um, but I can't fit into it. (laughs) (laughs) But you're working on that. I'm working on it. And so the, you know, the purple jacket for me is a symbolism of what really happens to people in the midst of caregiving. You, you, You get so involved in taking care of somebody else that you forget to take care of yourself. And for me, the 
uh, I know that I'll be back on the road to taking care of myself when I can fit into that purple jacket. Well, Chris, I know you, as I've said, and I think you're already on the road just from the discussions we've had. Um, you are well on the road. Thank you. And, and it's not I'll an easy thing. It, it's, it's not an not. easy thing. No, you know, it's funny. I was listening to what to the, uh, the your quote that you used from Rosalind Carter, which is so beautiful, uh, and the last one, those who need care. You know, and I, I just I thought to myself, you know, when caregiving ends, caregivers really need care. And we forget about those folks after caregiving ends because we're so intent in the middle of care that uh, sometimes we forget about those folks who whose caregiving journey has ended. And that's the topic of our show today. Um, Chris, you know, both of us work um, and talk to so many caregivers on a regular basis. And, you know, caregiving does eventually come to an end. And if you're caring for someone who's older than you, the chances are that person is going to eventually pass on. And there you are. You're left. And for so many people, they're just lost. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have talked to caregivers that have approached me and said, I really don't know what to do with myself anymore now that I'm not a caregiver. I don't know who I am. So that's the the topic of our show today. Yeah, that's so true, Tula. I'm I'm looking forward to chatting about this. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about ways, first of all, to prevent that um, from, from occurring because the saddest thing in the world for me anyway, is for your caregiving journey to end and then to be lost and to not know who you are anymore. And um, let's talk about what you can do while you're caring for a loved one to prevent that from happening. I'm a big believer in prevention. Yes, I am too, you know, but it it, it is difficult in one sense to to prepare or plan for the day when there are no more days with your with your carry with your care recipient your partner your spouse but there are some there are some things that you can do you know the, the pragmatic things obviously are having your um, all your important documents in place you know the last thing you want to be at the uh, at this time is looking for those documents or trying to uh, to to develop those documents but you know, with that, I think it's also important to, to keep in mind that, especially if you've enlisted a, uh, a, a care team that has helped help you in the process, you know, continue to lean on them as well because, you know, they've been intimately involved in your in the in the caregiving process with you, and uh, you know, reach out to them as well and and. Because because they're going to be in the grieving process also, it won't may, maybe not be as intense as what you might be experiencing, but they're you know the care team is real important to to help you along after caregiving ends as well. I think that's a really good point because so many people don't form a care care team. So many people think I have to do this all myself. Um, and they try to do it all their own without enlisting the help of other family members or friends who really want to help. And the best thing you can do for yourself and for the person you're taking care of is get other people involved in the care. Because let's face it, it's best for you so that you can have a break from time to time. And the person you're taking care of might want a different face, a different voice, somebody else. They might a break from you as well. They might want a break from you as well. And that's just life, you know. Um, we all love our, our friends, our families that we take care of, but we just need a break from each other from time to time. Speak, <laughs> speaking of break, speaking uh, of break, speaking I, of hear break I hear music too. That means we're getting ready to take one. You are listening to Tula's Tips from Caregivers on AM 600 and FM 100.3 WBOB. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. 
Hi, this is Tula, and I'm here to talk to you about Baptist New Age Well Institute. Are you caring for a loved one who's 65 or older? Are you a boomer like myself who's caring for a parent? And perhaps your parent has been experiencing some decline in their overall health. Let me highly recommend to you the Baptist Age Well Institute. They have the only real geriatrician here in Northeast Florida who is able to look at the whole person. Their comprehensive approach includes a a nurse, a doctor, a social worker, a pharmacist, a dietitian. They have their own physical therapy there. They can work with folks with memory disorders. My goal is to help you, the caregiver, find an organization that can care for your loved one who's 65 or older. I take my own parents there, and I highly recommend the Edgewell Institute at Baptist. Please give them a call at 904-202-4243. Again, that's 904-202-4243. You'll be so glad you did. Have you read the new book, Love Stories and Timeless Tips, yet? It's by our own Tula Wooten with Tula's Tips for Caregivers. Tula is a caregiver, too, as well as an expert on caregiving. You can get it in paperback or on Kindle at Amazon.com. The book is filled with touching stories of caregivers taking care of their loved ones. Each chapter has helpful ideas that we all can use. I love that Tula included a Tula's tip with each story. Her message to caregivers is clear. Take care of yourself so that you can take care of your loved one. This is a beautiful book for all caregivers to read, whether you're a part-time, full-time, or long-distance caregiver, or someone receiving care. You should get the book today. Just go to Amazon. Com. Search for Love Stories and Timeless Tips by Tula Wooten. George, I got the job. Thanks, I'm so excited. They hired me on the spot right after the interview. It was that book I bought from Amazon, From the Interview to the Paycheck by Fred Haley. The book really taught me something. It helped me to think about what the boss wants. Then it helped me with answers that show that I can do the job. I can tell they were impressed when I introduced myself. I just followed the simple outline from the interview to the paycheck book, and I know I won the job with my first 90 days plan the book recommended. They said no one else had ever been so prepared. You should get the book. It's on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle. It's worth it if you want to get hired. Just search for From the Interview to the Paycheck by Fred Haley. Do it now. And now let's return to Tula's Tips for Caregivers, brought to you in part by AgeWell Institute at Baptist Health, by Elmcroft Assisted Living and Memory Care, by Apex Home Health Care, by the AARP, and by Bartram Lakes Brooks Assisted Living. Once again, here's Tula. Welcome back, everyone. If you've just joined me, my guest today is my friend, colleague, and radio show host, Chris McKellen. You know, Chris, at the top of the hour, we meant to give you a little bit of time to talk about your own caregiving experience and kind of what you've been doing since. So let me um, apologize to you, first of all, and let's do that. Well, I appreciate that uh, opportunity and no apologies uh, needed, but um, I cared for my uh, partner of 11 years, uh, Richard Schiffer. Uh, Richard was diagnosed, <clears throat> pardon me, with esophageal cancer in the um, 2011. He was given three to four months to live, and he ended up living about 29 months past his original diagnosis. Um, You know, from that experience, um, there was a story that was written about uh, us in the South Florida Sun Sentinel in sickness and health, uh, a couple's final journey as we allowed two wonderful journalists to follow us on our on our journey. And that story actually went viral. It's been seen by over 400,000 people worldwide. And it's kind of propelled me to, um, to be an advocate for caregivers. I, I, uh, you know, I've been in the social work field. I've, I've done also worked in non-ordained ministry, but, um, you know, I, I I look at this issue a little bit differently. I, I'm I'm coming now from a communication uh, perspective on this. Uh, I just finished my, master's degree in uh, uh, leadership and communication from Gonzaga University and wrote a thesis about uh, caregiving stress and its impact in the workplace. And I, 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 I'm kind of on a mission to, to help caregivers, employers, employees communicate better, communicate their needs back and forth. And I, I think by taking this different approach, because uh, you know, folks like yourself who are in the trenches working in the 
in the social work field and hospice. You guys are doing an awesome job. Um, but I want to look at it this a little bit different because it all comes down to communication, how a caregiver communicates their, their needs uh, to, the, to, the, to the physicians, how the caree communicates their needs to the caregiver. Um, we just need to do a better job in communicating, and I'm, I'm hoping to have an impact um, in this field because of communication. Well, I think so much of the important things that we need in life really do boil down to how we communicate with others. Um, that is definitely... Very much so. Mm-hmm. Whether it's be, um, you know, marriage relationships, other relationships, um, family relationships involving mothers, children, fathers, children, aunts, uncles, and to the employer situation like you just described. Um, I know that you've heard the term, Chris, the silent working caregiver. Um, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Let's talk talk about that a little bit and why, why that is. Well, uh, <clears throat> It's amazing to me in the research that I did that while there's an estimate of 43, over 43 million family caregivers in the United States alone, we all think that we're the only ones doing it. Mm -hmm. And we're reluctant at times to uh, talk openly about it, uh, especially especially at work, because, uh, you know, caregiving is not a glamorous thing. Uh, But... The, the funny thing about it, when you do talk talk to somebody or about caregiving, you feel better about it. Nine times out of ten, you're going to talk to somebody that is either in a caregiving situation themselves or have been in a caregiving situation or know somebody that's in a caregiving situation. Right. That, that immediately brings comfort when caregivers can share their story with one another. There's, I, I, to me, there's no better medicine for a caregiver than to be able to share their story with someone else. There's immediate, it's immediate comfort. I agree with you, and you know, um, you've probably heard, you've probably heard me use the term caregiver buddy. Um, I really yes. believe um, that those of us who are caring for a loved one need to find somebody else who's doing the same thing. They don't have to be caring for the same type of um, relational person; doesn't have to be the same. But to be caring for someone can involve so much of your day to day emotions, time, energy, every resource you have within you and if you don't have somebody else to talk to about that sometimes commiserate sometimes share the happy stories um with you you're not going to make it out whole and healthy um on the other other end and that's our goal you know let's face it that's what that's what we want (laughs) we want to take good care of our loved one we want to make sure they have the best quality of life and everything that they need but when that ends you want to come out Whole and healthy. You don't. You don't want to be sick. You don't want to be isolated. Um, so I really do think that we. You know, it's so important to have somebody else in your life who's going through the same experiences that you are that you can share with, and that will help you so much. And back to again the main topic of our show today: um, How do you cope with life? Who are you again once caregiving ends? That's going to prevent so much of the loss that we alluded to earlier. Um, If you've maintained those relationships. And sometimes uh, in the transition, the relationships change because, um, uh, you know, when when life transitions, uh, it's more than one life that just transitions. You you, you as the caregiver, your life transitions. (laughs) The people around you transition as well. And you said a key word earlier uh, that that is so important to avoid, but it easily happens, isolation. Uh, I'm the poster child for what not to do after caregiving ends. And I isolated myself for a good year, year and a half. And you don't realize it at first, Mm -hmm. but the isolation really starts prior to the life transition. It starts those last couple of months um, when you know that you're, you're the person that you're caring for is, is um, you know that that transition is close. You you're, you're home more. You're not going out. Uh, you're, you're you're not seeing your friends. 
that that isolation really starts before the life transition and just permeates afterwards because you just you find yourself in a new realm and you just don't know what to do yeah and that's not a good place to be um you know and i can't find it now i was just looking for it but a friend of mine and a colleague here in the community just posted a study that shows that in finland caregivers have a really high mortality and suicide rate due to isolation that just stumped I, I, me. Yeah, it's sad. It's very sad, but it's not surprising uh, either. You know, there's a there's a unique thing about caregivers is that uh, you know while our caregiving situations may be different, we have this unique ability to understand each other. Mm-hmm. But with that, um, you know, who who prepares for caregiving? You know, nobody. Pre- there's no preparation for it, as is there's no preparation for when it ends, and that's why it's important that we have these conversations, that that, that we have these end of life conversations so openly, um, so that people don't fall into this trap of isolation and can find the resources to to healthy to move on with their life healthy. And again, um, you know, let's let's talk about the whole end of life scenario because very often that is how caregiving ends. Um, your loved one passes on, and you know, and alluded to earlier that I work for our local hospice provider here in Northeast Florida, Community Hospice of Northeast Florida. And um, if your loved one dies in hospice care, you have been surrounded by a team that cares about not just your loved one, but about you. As well, and because the whole hospice model embraces the family members and other caregivers as much yeah. as the person who is is dying, and when that person does eventually die, you're not left alone. You're hospice, not left alone. Hospice care yeah. doesn't stop. Yeah, I have such a uh, a positive viewpoint of hospice. I'm not sure if you know this, Atula, but I, I, I did have one unit of CPE in hospice a number of years ago, clinical pastoral education, and it was a life-changing experience for me. I, uh, while I knew that was not, hospice was not my calling, seeing how hospice, how it worked, the, the change it made in not only uh, the families, but in the professionals who were who were involved in hospice, uh, the, the the change that in doctors and nurses, uh, it, it is without a doubt one beautiful one beautiful experience, and I I highly recommend hospice to to, to anybody that uh, is in that is in that situation and in that need. And, and what I was really trying to describe a few minutes ago is. When your loved one dies, you know, at least here in Northeast Florida, Community Hospice offers bereavement counseling to those who have lost a loved one. And we go so far as to offer our bereavement services and counseling, both one-on-one and in group therapy, even to those who've lost a loved one who didn't die in our program. Um, And I think that's one of the, the most important things that you can do as a caregiver when your loved one dies, is avail yourself of someone to walk you through that journey. You don't have to do this alone. It hurts, and we're we're not geared to be able to do that alone. No, and and oftentimes we end up thinking that oh, I can I can deal with this. This, you know, for instance, here's an example. Uh, if you're employed, how many bereavement days do you get? Three, three. Most at most, most places, at, at most places, and I, I, you know, our mindset tells us, well, if, if my employer is only giving me three days, I should be over this in three days. Well, nobody's going to be over this in three days. It's that whole mindset about changing the way we think, right, and communicating our needs and attending to ourselves after caregiving ends. Let's talk about that a little bit more. How we can do that, Chris, when we get back from this commercial break. How we can really take care of ourselves after caregiving ends you're listening to tula's tips for caregivers on am 600 and fm 100.3 wbob we'll be right back
Hugh, Hewitt, Laura, Ingram, Dennis Prager, The Savage Nation, Mark Levin, WBOB, AM 600, The Answer. With SRN News, I'm Bob Agnew in Washington. Serena Williams has won her 22nd major tennis title. The American beat Angelique Kerber at the Wimbledon final to tie Steffi Graf's record for the most major championships in the open era. French police and troops are gearing up for their biggest security challenge since the deadly November 13th attacks across Paris last year. Hundreds of thousands of soccer fans are expected in the French capital for tomorrow's European championship finale. France is hoping to win its third European title when it plays Portugal at the stadium where three suicide bombers blew themselves up last year. Uh, obviously, security concerns will be high. Iraq's prime minister says government forces have now recaptured a key air base from the Islamic State group. The prime minister, Haider al Abadi is describing the recapture of the base known as Karaya in northern Iraq as important to the long-awaited military operation to retake the area. This is SRN News. One in five Americans will be diagnosed with skin cancer in their lifetime. If skin cancer is detected early enough, it can be treated with a high degree of success. Advantage Dermatology is here to help. Their board-certified physicians and physician's assistants specialize in skin evaluation, cutaneous oncology, and Mohs micrographic and reconstructive surgery, which is performed in their dedicated surgical suites. Remember, the best offense is a good defense. Advantage Dermatology. Call 904-387-4991. Online at AdvantageDerm.com. Repeat Day is coming back to Zaxby's Restaurant on San Jose Boulevard at Marvin Road. Saturday, July 16th, Zaxby's is inviting guests to join them on Repeat Day. Keep your yellow receipt, then return any time from August 15th through September 11th and receive all your food on your yellow receipt for free. Just remember, keep your yellow receipt from Repeat Day on July 16th and return from August 15th through September 11th and get everything on your receipt absolutely free. Offer is good at the Zaxby's at 12301 San Jose Boulevard only. Gift cards, party platters, call-ins, online orders, catering, and boxed lunches excluded. This is just a small way for Zaxby's to say thank you to their loyal fans. So come join them on Saturday, July 16th for Repeat Day at Zaxby's on San Jose Boulevard at Marvin Road. Sometimes the best laid plans just don't work out. Unfortunately, this includes marriage. If you and your spouse can't reconcile your differences, then maybe it's time to consider divorce. The sooner you take action, the sooner you can close this chapter and begin a new one. At Absolute Legal Clinic, they understand your situation. Divorce can be painful, but it doesn't have to be expensive. In most cases, Absolute Legal Clinic can handle divorce cases for as little as $400. Absolute Legal Clinic. Call 322-0062. Online at AbsoluteLegalClinic.com. We constitutional conservatives are constantly under attack. We're under attack from the left. We're under attack from the, from the big media. And we're under attack within the Republican Party. We're under attack within the Republican Party. The only man to break through this was Ronald Reagan, and he had to do it, fight like hell, three times, and finally broke through, and he won two massive landslides. Mark Levin at 6 on WBOB, The Answer. Stuck in traffic, WBOB has the answer. Look at some action on the road. Uh, Middle lane is blocked at 95 northbound at the Main Street Bridge. Another crash at 95 southbound, one at mile marker 351, and then another at mile marker 381. Uh, stay cool today, looking for a heat index near 105. Otherwise, 20% chance of showers. Uh, mostly clear at night, steady during the day. It's currently 91 at WBOB AM 600. The answer. And now let's return to Tula's Tips for Caregivers, brought to you in part by AgeWell Institute at Baptist Health, by Elmcroft Assisted Living and Memory Care, by Apex Home Health Care, by the AARP, and by Bartram Lakes Brooks Assisted Living. Once again, here's Tula. Welcome back, everyone. If you've just joined me, my guest today is Chris McKellen. He is my friend and colleague in caregiving world. Um, he also has a radio show. That cause it's called the healing ties that bind and we are talking today about how do you prepare for when caregiving ends and how do you take care of yourself when caregiving ends who are you and how do you move forward chris i know that you know you've already told us that um 
You didn't do a real good job at that after after Richard died. You you isolated. Yeah. Um, I did, yeah. For a while. And you know what? I understand that because there's such profound sadness and grief um, when you experience the loss of someone you love so deeply. Yet, we know that that's the worst thing you can do. Exactly. And it's, it, it's hard to... Uh, to recognize it when you're in the middle of it, uh, it, it's almost like losing two relationships in one. You're losing the uh, the person that you're connected to, and then you're losing the uh, you know the caregiving experience. Uh, you know, for me, um, you know, I, I kind of I, as I look back on it, I, I kind of see there's four major emotions that I think is common that we all experience. And I, if you'd like to talk about that, I'd be happy to do that. I'd like to do that. Let's do that. Yeah, I, you know, it, it, there's four, I, I feel we all experience these four emotions at some point. It's it's going to be different for each, for everybody. But the first emotion is relief. We, you know, let's be realistic. You know, we are relieved that the caregiving is over. You know, those those long sleepless nights, you know, when we're sleeping with one eye open, we're wondering, you know, what's going to happen. I mean, those those are now over with. Uh, and you and you know that the one you cared for is now pain free, you know. So there's some relief there, but uh, and you know, and the sadness kind of comes in. You know, you, you recognize that your life is forever changed, and you know there's that reality that you've got to uh, that you've got to move on to something else. And you know, for me, that was that was hard and. That's where the guilt comes in. Mm-hmm. You know, that 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 in my my Catholic background, I'm really good at guilt. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know those what ifs. You know, could I have done something different? I, I you know, for for a long time, I I wondered I, I wondered if I could have done something different when when Richard went into hospice. If I would have stayed that first night. Um, you know, you, the guilt of moving on with your life, but sooner or later you you come to that realization that no matter what you think you could have done uh, during the caregiving journey, like and I'll use Richard as an example. Richard's destiny was predetermined. No mm-hmm. matter what I thought I could have done for him, or what I thought the doctors could have done for him. You know, his destiny was already predetermined, and there's nothing any of us can do. That's, that's an important thing. Into, it is. It doesn't. You don't. You, you, guilt is the is the most difficult of the emotion that I, that I find because you can get you can wallow in guilt. Mm-hmm. Those what ifs. Oh gosh, if I could have done this differently. Well, you know what? So you know, so we did something different that first night in the hospice before he, he made his turn for the worst. What would that would have bought us? Another two more weeks? Maybe, maybe uh, not. You, you, you can't ever yeah, go you, back and, and you, you don't know. You'll never you, know. You don't know. But your mind, your, your, the, your mind plays so many tricks on you that you think, mm-hmm. oh, my God, he, you know, we, we've been so attentive all for, for 29 months. He, he's just going to get up and move again. Well, you know, mm-hmm. his destiny was predetermined, and we – even our even our caregiving capes can't fix that. <laughs> no, but, and we think we have we're supermen, superwomen caregivers. Sometime, don't we? Yeah, we think we're going to snap our cape and we're going to we're going to be attentive. You know, and I just share a quick story with you. The you know we went to the we went to hospice with the mindset that we'd be home in a couple of days, and when it took a turn for the worst. Um, you know, I, I had these copious notes, and I'm talking to the doctors on Friday. We'd been there since Monday night, and I, I wanted to know this, 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 and this. And the two doctors looked at me and said, we don't know how this man has lived as long as he's lived, considering the amount of cancer it's in him. It's only attributed to the love and care that the two of you have for one another that he's lived this long. Well, I mean, that just stopped me in my tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, Hopefully you go move. back. Hopefully you go back to that statement for comfort. I I do, and I you know I hear it differently now. 
And that's what's so, it, 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 kind of digress here just for a second. That's why it's so important for caregivers to find some outlet, whether it's blogging, journaling, uh, taking time to meditate or pray, some, having something that you can go back to and reference these times after caregiving ends. You know, we were fortunate with the story. Richard and I did a couple of interviews as well that I can, I can go back and listen to. I can look at the blog post. That is what helps move you to acceptance. You know, there's no timetable for when it's going to happen because each person, it, it happens to everybody differently. But you, know, you, you wake up one morning and you say to yourself, you know what? Job well done. There you go. You've got to and get to that point because you, you gave all you could give. Point. Yeah, you, you've got to get to it. And it's going to... It's going to be different for everybody. Not everybody. You're not going to get to acceptance uh, at the same time, but you you just need to find that strength because uh, acceptance frees you from what binds you. Right. And it's just so, so important to be able to move on. I I wouldn't be able to talk as freely and openly about this if I had not gotten to acceptance. It's an important place that you have to get to and, and un, like we said before, understand that, you know, we are all imperfect beings. But in that role, you gave of yourself as much as you could give and cared for the person that you loved completely. Were you perfect? No, probably not. Because I'm not perfect. Right. You're not perfect. Richard wasn't perfect. But you gave of yourself and cared for that person. And that's what counts. And You've got to go back to, again, that statement that the doctor made. I want to go back to relief for just a minute because I know that, you know, these emotions are kind of like dropping a pebble in a pond and watching the whirlpool, and then they all mix together. You don't just go through one and then move to the other and then go to the other. They all interact and go back and forth, and you come from one back to the other. But, you know, when you feel relief when the caregiving journey ends – that can produce guilt because then you start thinking, oh, my God, why am I feeling relief at this? You know, <laughs> I don't feel relieved that they're gone because I miss them and I, and I love them. But you can. It's OK to feel relief from the day to day challenges and be oh, not miss the struggles that you had. That's OK. Right. Don't let that produce guilt in you. Exactly. And, and be mindful of the fact that even in that transition, the person who you love and cared for, they are now forever pain-free. Yep. And that and in, brings comfort. It does bring comfort. Sure. Uh, every, you know, I'm not unique to somebody who's lost a loved one. Uh, you've experienced it yourself. We've all. But we all deal with it differently. And uh, that's why it's so important to have these conversations. Yep, and it's important, you know, when you can to have important conversations with like this with the person that you're taking care of. Oh my yeah. goodness, yes, yes. Thanks for thanks for Richard and I. You know, we had those open conversations. I mean, I knew his wishes 100, percent and uh, you know, the day it was time to go to high, because you know, he told me a long time ago that I will tell you when I'm ready for hospice. And the day when hospice came, he got out of the chair himself without any assistance and got right to the uh, gurney uh, for the ambulance to take him to the hospital. And that was his way of telling me he was ready to go to hospice. I might not have been ready for it, but he was telling me what he wanted because we had had those conversations before. Yeah, and that's so hard for so many people to do, but it's critical um, to have those important conversations with the person that you love and that you're taking care of about what their wishes are, what they want and don't want. We've got a lot of more ground to cover when we get back. Um, <laughs> you are listening to Tula's Tips for Caregivers on AM 600 and FM 100.3 WBOB. We'll be right back. Have you read the new book, Love Stories and Timeless Tips, yet? It's by our own Tula Wooten with Tula's Tips for Caregivers. Tula is a caregiver, too, as well as an expert on caregiving. 
You can get it in paperback or on Kindle at Amazon.com. The book is filled with touching stories of caregivers taking care of their loved ones. Each chapter has helpful ideas that we all can use. I love that Tula included a Tula's tip with each story. Her message to caregivers is clear. Take care of yourself so that you can take care of your loved one. This is a beautiful book for all caregivers to read, whether you're a part-time, full-time, or long-distance caregiver, or someone receiving care. You should get the book today. Just go to Amazon.com. Search for Love Stories and Timeless Tips by Tula Wooten. Hi, everyone. This is Tula again, and I'm here to tell you about the Agewell Institute at Baptist Health. They're located in the San Marco area. I've been taking my own parents there for about two years now. Dr. Lance, the geriatrician on staff, has done remarkable things for both my parents and for me, the caregiver. They have great information, advice, and resources to help me. Dr. Lance and her team of social workers, dietitians, nurses, therapists, and the pharmacist have been so so instrumental in helping me keep my own parents independent and living in their own home where they want to be. If you're looking for someone to either supplement the care that your primary physician is giving to your loved one who's 65 or older, or to perhaps become their primary care physician, I really encourage you to call the Agewell Institute at Baptist. Their number is 904-202-4243. Again, that's 904-202-4243. George, I got the job. Thanks, I'm so excited. They hired me on the spot right after the interview. It was that book I bought from Amazon, From the Interview to the Paycheck by Fred Haley. The book really taught me something. It helped me to think about what the boss wants. Then it helped me with answers that show that I can do the job. I can tell they were impressed when I introduced myself. I just followed the simple outline from the interview to the paycheck book. And I know I won the job with my first 90 days plan the book recommended. They said no one else had ever been so prepared. You should get the book. It's on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle. It's worth it if you want to get hired. Just search for From the Interview to the Paycheck by Fred Haley. Do it now. Have you noticed that mom or dad seems to be slipping a bit? Forgetting appointments, skipping meals, repeating stories? You know they're not ready for a nursing home, yet they could benefit from some kind of help. Brooks Rehabilitation invites you to redefine assisted living at Bartram Lakes. Bartram Lakes Assisted Living offers care and services for adults who value choice and independence, yet benefit from 24-7 support. Our residents embrace life, develop friendships, and live life to its fullest. Our residents' families benefit from having peace of mind, knowing that Brooks Rehabilitation... A trusted name in Jacksonville Healthcare for 40 years is overseeing their loved one's care. Come and visit Bartram Lakes Assisted Living. To schedule a tour, call 904-528-3515. That's 904-528-3515. Or visit www.bartramlakes.org. And now let's return to Tula's Tips for Caregivers, brought to you in part by Agewell Institute at Baptist Health, by Elmcroft Assisted Living and Memory Care, by Apex Home Health Care, by the AARP, and by Bartram Lakes Brooks Assisted Living. Once again, here's Tula. Welcome back, everyone. It's the last segment of the show, and again, it always goes so fast. Chris McKellen and I, my colleague and radio show host um, with his own show called The Healing Ties That Bind, are talking about how to take care of yourself, who you are after caregiving ends. We've talked a little bit about prevention, some things that you can do to prevent. What I hear so commonly is I don't know who I am now that my caregiving role has ended. Um, Let's talk a little bit more, Chris, um, about what you can do for yourself and really this, I want you to give us some examples of how you've taken care of yourself now that you've come out of your isolation. What are some things you're doing for yourself as you try to move on and become a healthier, all the way around, healthier you? Well, I, I think it, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's about connecting yourself with, uh, with people who are supportive. Um, I've been very fortunate, especially the last uh, six, eight months, where I've had... Um, Uh, a couple of people really push me gently to get back to do some of the things that I like to do. For instance, I'll give you a little secret you may not know. I used to be a professional bowler. (laughs) No, didn't know that. Long time ago. 
and I, I hadn't bowled in years. Well, you know, why don't you go, you know, let's go bowling one day. I, and I got back into bowling. I, I, I used to ice skate quite a bit. I, I, I started I started doing things that I knew that I was good at that really helped regain my confidence in myself and surrounding and surrounding myself with you know with like-minded people people who um, who may have been through some of these similar experiences and demonstrated to me how they've worked through them uh, because life after care you know life life has changed life is different yeah. and uh, you know you've got to as you lose your hobbies in the midst of caregiving, sometimes when you're coming out of hobby, coming out of caregiving, you have to find those new hobbies because I think there's one thing that's common for all of us uh, when we, after caregiving ends is we stop living. Yeah. We just stop living, and it you know it happens. And and the the more you turn inward, the harder it is to step outside. Which, again, points back to the fact that you really need to try to not do that when you're caring for a loved one. It is so important to maintain connections with the other people in your life that you know and love. Don't lose those connections. Don't stop spending time with those people because it may be hard to pick up those relationships again. Sure. After sure. two you know, years. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. You know, once... Uh, I came to the realization that I stopped living. That's when I started to realize that uh, I had to live in the present. Um, mm-hmm. Sure, it, it doesn't mean I miss him any less or the miss the person that that we loved and cared for any le- any any less. But we have to find a way to live in the present. And uh, easier said than done. But the first step is to recognize it. Right. And and once you recognize it then uh, you you move out of that guilt process and move into acceptance. And then you can start doing some of the things maybe that you stopped doing or maybe find some new hobbies, like you said, yeah. um, some new things that you didn't used to do. But, you know, the, the what we're trying to say here is get out into the world, talk to others. Out into the world. Reacquaint. Yeah. It's so important. And then, you know, and one of the other things I've seen some people do um, at the end of their caregiving journey, Chris, is using those skills that they learned as a caregiver and turn them into professional skills. Um, I've, yes. I've, I've seen many caregivers um, after their loved one has passed on and they take time to heal um, and take care of themselves, go on and become nurses, maybe geriatric care managers or social workers. I, I think of a couple of people in the community who decided, you know, I really love this caregiving role. And so I want to um, get the licensure as a home health aide or a CNA and care for others. And so sometimes they become caregivers of other people. It can be such a rewarding role. Um, it's Very not all so. just stressful. It's it's building a relationship with somebody you're taking care of and building memories and sweet time. So that I've seen many, many people um, go on and become caregivers for others. Right. And, you know, I, I for me, I... This propelled me to finish my master's degree. I'm, I'm right now going through a couple of certification classes as a certified caregiving consultant and educator. Because, I, you know, for me, sharing the experience is really what uh, helps me heal as well. Because I know when we share with each other, the, it does help. Yeah. Not only ourselves, but the, the pe- person who who just needs a, a kind word or somebody to, somebody's shoulder to lean on. Well, we know that, um, as our friend Joni says, advocacy heals you. So when you are caring for another person or giving to another person, no matter what you are feeling on the inside, you too will be healed from that experience. So again, getting out of your inward self and going out into your sphere of influence, into your community, and giving to others, serving others, volunteering you know, find a new role that's meaningful to you. And while you are helping other people, this is what you're doing now, Chris. It helps heal you, doesn't it? Exactly. And I and I think, um, you know, the, the best words of advice that were given to me after Richard made his life transition was, the pain of losing him will get softer, 
mm-hmm. but the love you share will always be strong. And I think of those words quite often, and it's, you know, it's important for me to share that with, with you and your listeners because, you know, that, that old cliche, time does heal all wounds. But uh, wounds heal in their own time and at their own pace, and that's okay. And, and in your time, this does get better. It does. It does get better. It does take time, but it does get better. And, you know, back to what you talked about earlier, there is no appropriate or predetermined time frame. It's different with everybody. Don't ever let anybody tell you, you know, it's been six months, it's been a year, it's been two years, you should be over that now. Um, you will never, ah, you will never yeah. be there. It, if, somebody in a, it, if somebody approaches you and says that, you know, my response would be, you know, well, thank you for your concern, but I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just not there yet, but I appreciate, I appreciate your concern. I think it, the counselor in me would have to sit them right down <laughs> and, and teach them a few things, but that's who I am, <laughs> you know, yeah. because actually I'd well, probably... I'd want, do, I, I'd want to do that too, but... <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, you'd have to refrain. You're probably stronger than me, and, and you could refrain um, from doing that because, you know, loss happens to all of us. Yeah. None of us are going to be exempt. We're, we're not, none of us are immune from it. We're all going to deal with it, um, but... For some reason in our society, we just have a hard time talking about this. And when we can talk openly and honestly, um, it, it is kind of, it, I don't want to put it as simplistically as this, but it, it does make it easier. Of course, um, sharing with others. You have shared with many others the experience that you had in caring for Richard and the love. And that's what's helped heal you. Through all of this, very much so, and and you coined it perfectly with our friend uh, Joni. Advocacy does heal us. It's not the easiest yeah. thing in the world to do to get outside of yourself when you're hurting and mm-hmm. want to help others. It's it takes an internal fortitude and a push, and maybe somebody else giving you that gentle push, as you mentioned earlier. But when mm-hmm. you do that. And you are seeing other people become better from whatever situation they're in. Truly, you heal. 100%. 100%. And so, if I could say anything to those of you who are listening today, um, again, while you're taking care of your loved one, please make sure you don't lose sight of all the things that are meaningful to you in your life other than caring for your loved one. Don't stop connecting with your other friends and family members. They need you. You need them, and they need you, too. They don't want to lose you either. So stay connected to the people that you love. And when it does end, when caregiving does end and you find yourself on your own, remember what Chris has shared today, that isolation is the worst thing you can do. Get out into the community. Chris, again, we're getting ready to end. Anything you want to share? Anything you want to give any contact information before we... Well, you know, you, you can find me at uh, thebowtieguy.com or The Purple Jacket. And my book, uh, What to Deal with Caregiving, is available on Amazon. I appreciate the allowing me to get the plugs. Thank you very much, Chris, for being my guest today. You've been listening for Two List Tips for Caregivers on AM 600 and FM 100.3 WBOB. I'll be back next Saturday. Blessings, everyone.